<laughs> All right, so welcome. Thank you for coming back to the 2022 DOE Summit. We are excited to welcome uh, John J. Davies uh, from the US, the, the US Army. Uh, Mr. Davies has a lengthy background applying process optimization tools in the solar cell and ceramics industry. For the past 12 years, Mr. Davies has been a research physicist with the U.S. Army DEVCOM Chemical Biological Center at Aberdeen Proving Gar Grounds, Maryland. He is a member of the Decontamination Sciences Branch, which specializes in developing techniques and chemistries to neutralize chemical warfare agents. He is dedicated to, apl to applied statistical analysis ranging from multi-laboratory precision studies to design of experiments. The decontamination sciences branch has been integrating DOE methods into many of their chemical agent decontamination research programs. Specifically, over the past several years, Mr. Davies has worked with researchers to develop mixture process DOE techniques to simultaneously model the effect, the influences of formulation components and process conditions which has greatly accelerated the optimization process for decontamination formulations. The introduction of DOE methodology has reduced sample sizes by 70 to 90%, while at the same time allowing for more variables to be included in the studies, which has resulted in many unexpected scientific discoveries. So I am happy to welcome uh, Dr. John J. Davies. Hello, okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Sherry. And um, uh, first off, uh, I thank everyone from Statis, particularly Sherry, for hosting this and helping us work through some technical problems. And I definitely thank everyone that's tuned in here. Uh, I do appreciate it. I like talking about this stuff. Hopefully you get something out of it. And uh, I'll say so far that this has been a, a great all three days. We've had some advanced uh, advanced techniques, but it's all been practical and applied, which is the way that I like it. And there's been some hard acts to follow. I'll say the bar has been set pretty high, so I'm feeling a little bit of pressure here. So I'll, I'll try not to drop the ball, do the best I can. Hopefully I'll say something that hasn't already been said yet. Uh, first off, the disclaimer, um, have to do this. Uh, anything that I say is my opinion. If I talk about a software or a technique, it doesn't necessarily represent an official uh, opinion of the of the Army, Department of Defense, or the federal government. And got some acknowledgments that I uh, very much need to point out. Uh, first of all, I have a list of several people from Sadies here. I've been uh, using the software, attending live uh, live work, uh, live webinars, live workshops, uh, done some online, and it's been really really great, really in instrumental. And I'll say the thing that really stands out is when you go to these trainings, I'm sitting there in the training and I'm thinking, I can use this here, I can use that there. Day one returning, I'm building design. So it's, I've been to a lot of talks that are maybe more theoretical, you learn some great statistics, but I'm not sure if I'll ever use that theory. So um, you know, forget, I'll say that. Uh, Dr. Tom Donnelly with SAS Jump helped me out a lot over the years. He used to work with me actually at, at CBC many years ago. And I'll mention him in particular for recommending the use of checkpoints. I always, I always embed uh, in Design Expert, I create them as lack of fit points and, and inject them into my designs, kind of like an, an inline validation. Don't fit the model with them, just use it to test the model. That's, use that with every design I do. And Peter Bertel, I'll mention from Jump because one time was at a seminar where he said, uh, you know, the first three rules of any kind of analytics uh, fit in the model, plot the data, plot the data, plot the data. Just like the first three uh, rules of real estate, uh, that's always stuck with me. And then I'll, I'll thank my, my local uh, comrades. Um, Joe Myers was the principal investigator for the formulation DOE project I'm gonna talk about. Clear Scientific was our industry partner. And uh, DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, funds us. And many people in the lab uh, execute these uh, seemingly crazy convoluted designs we put together and uh, with, with um, they have to jump jump through some hoops to do it, but they get done in a day, what they would normally have to experiment for months. So I guess, I guess it works out. 
And so I'll say a little bit more about my, my background, just the, uh, I'm a research physicist by title, but I'm really an applied experimentalist. Uh, they call me a statistician. I've had some background, some training. So I guess, yeah, very applied statistician. I'm an Army civilian, Department of Defense. I work at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, uh, a chemical biological center. We're in the research and technology directorate. So we do some basic research, but we really get into applied research and trying to get things that are going to work enough that we can pass them along to the you know, different agencies to develop it and get it in the field for the warfighters to use. I'm with the Chemical and Biological Protection Division, and the, the chemicals are chemical warfare agents, you know, some pretty bad, bad stuff. And same thing for biological agents. And most of the time we're testing using the, under very controlled conditions, using the, the live agents and such. I've been with the decontamination science branch for 13 years, and we, we, I concentrate mostly on decontamination, although I'm working with uh, different groups outside the um, outside of my home base. And prior to that, I had about 20 years at process engineering, solar cells, and, and uh, ceramic composites. And just another flow chart of my path, liked physics in high school, led to an interest in classic cars, just by default, studied physics in college. However, the last couple of years, I, I kind of felt like I was more of an engineer, process engineer, ended up taking a job that with a professor that was starting a solar cell company. Turned out it lasted 15 years, it was a, a big chunk of my career. But in the course of that, I got interested in through statistics, mainly from statistical process control. Didn't really get into DOE well, pretty much full time until I made the move to the government. I, I was exposed to an introductory class in 95, but it was very classical, didn't have a software associated with it, and then I just didn't get it. You know, unfortunately, I didn't apply it till you know quite a while later. Uh, one thing I'll throw out there, and I, and I don't throw this out to say, hey, look at us, look how great we are, but I throw this out to demonstrate that these techniques work. They're, they're simple, they're powerful. Uh, at the Ceramic Composite Company, we had a $5 O-ring that ended up saving the company $400,000 a month, and that was basically, wasn't, a, wasn't really any DOE in there. It was kind of like Six Sigma design thinking, but the key part was we defined the problem before we started trying to fix it. And we worked it all the way back to where you said, hey, we got this mechanical variation on this particular part of the process, seems to be very correlated to this defect, maybe not causality, but it's very correlated. We wrote a one paragraph um, definition of the problem, uh, thought we were starting, going to start this big uh, procedure to solve this problem, went into the first meeting, we read the paragraph, somebody from R&D said, hey, why didn't you tell us that in the beginning? If you're having that variation, yeah, that's going to cause that defect. We knew that we knew that eight years ago on the R&D bench. We have a simple solution. We, we solved it back then. Just go get an O-ring and stick it in the, in the machine here. Problem will go away. Oh, sounded kind of crazy, but we, we implemented it cautiously. Uh, it worked out pretty good. Got the results back a couple of days later, and then you know, pretty soon it was a full implementation. But the point of that story is we didn't even have to solve that problem. So all we had to do was be meticulous, use our analytics and logistic regression, define the problem clearly, and the solution was already within the company. We're throwing away $400,000 a month, and someone in that company knows the solution once they're presented the, the correct problem state. So an outline of uh, some of the things I'm gonna talk about, I got two parts. Uh, first part is gonna be more uh, some thoughts and experiences, some conceptual stuff. And I know we have students, maybe non-users, advanced users, try to do something for everybody. I'm going to talk about selling DOE because, you know, there it's a great thing. But once you're doing it, it sells itself. But getting people that are hooked on one factor at a time, intuition designs, it can be tough. And throughout this, I want to highlight the importance of the subject matter uh, expertise. Uh, one of our uh, past speakers, uh, John Coleman, I think, mentioned it's statistics and sciences concur 100%. That's the magic formula. And then I'll get into my actual case study example. I'll talk about the impact overall that DOE's had for us, and then I'll go into a case study. So who are we at CBC? I have a video here. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go out of presentation mode and see if we can get this video to play for us. In the video screen now. Um, yeah, it's black right now. Um, 
Yes, seeing it. And hearing. Biological Center has been an international leader in the CB Asks in World War One to destroying chemical weapons stockpiles. The center has evolved in its mission to protect the U.S. and Allied warfighters from chemical and biological threats. The threats we face are ever changing, from continuing to deal with World War One era chemical weapons to non-state actors to threats outside the battlefield. We continue to face and overcome these challenges, employing hundreds of the world's brightest chemists, biologists, and engineers. The center is well equipped to handle any challenge facing our warfighters and our nation. Our scientists are on the forefront of CV defense. We're destroying stockpiles of chemical warfare agent at home, providing chemical warfare material destruction solutions to the international community. In the lab, we're looking for the newest breakthroughs and building on the newest tools for the warfighter. In partnership with academia, industry, federal agencies, and allied nations, we serve not just the Army, but the joint military force protecting warfighters around the globe on land, in the air, and at sea. Through these partnerships, we'll improve our detection capabilities, updating traditional technologies like the JCAD and fielding new ones like the Min-Ion and Paper Spray. Our future holds untold advances, self-decontaminating uniforms, augmented reality in the field, and solutions that harness the natural abilities of living systems through synthetic biology. New advances will improve protection as we develop fibers that destroy chemical agent on contact, and we'll create new technologies that decontaminate chemical agent so the warfighter can complete their mission unhindered by contaminating equipment. Our vision is a world free from chemical and biological threats. For a century, we've delivered world-class solutions to these challenges, and we'll continue to do so for the next 100 years. Okay, uh, am I back in presentation mode now? You are back. Okay, great. Um, so that gives you an idea of what, Aberdeen Improvement Grounds is a big place. I think we have about 13,000 people, including mostly the uh, non-uniformed uh, DOD civilians. Uh, Aberdeen North, they're more into the cyber, into the, the tanks, the vehicles, uh, the, heavy, the heavy equipment. Uh, down on the south end used to be called Edgewood. We're the chemical and biological center. So everything you saw in that video, we've got our hands in from developing uh, decontamination, detection capabilities, and all the engineering support functions, the virtual reality, the, the 3D printing, all that stuff is within a block or two of my building. I can easily just walk over to it. And here's a quote by John Tukey that's, that's relevant to what we just watched. The best thing about being a statistician is you get to play in everyone's backyard. So. The CBC, you can see just, just in the CBC section, there's lots of backyards I can play in there. And I, and I do. I, I'm working with uh, synthetic biology people, with engineers uh, that are optimizing vapor levels in chambers. I'm doing a lot, of course, a lot with the, with the, uh, the chemical stuff and in some, in some. However, I, I'll put a caveat on that. When you're the new kid on the block, you can't just show up in everyone's backyard and say, hey, I want to change the way you guys play, been playing the game that you're very happy with. You know, if there's a lot of intuition experimentation, one factor at a time, you have to be tactful, you have to be patient. And, uh, you know, now that I've established myself and I have credibility, yeah, I can move freely between the backyards. But it wasn't like that initially. And here's a, here's a quote here by George Box that, that kind of, you know, that this resistance towards uh, statistical methods. He said this in 1967 that uh, chemists and physicists, they often graduate uh, without a knowledge of, of statistical methods. They're often unaware of their value in their work. An early reaction when, they, when they're introduced to them is that uh, the subject is, is that statistical methods, they're in some way an alternative to whatever they would normally have done, an alternative which is applied by enthusiasts which is entirely optional. And I've inserted the word practical applied statistics because when I, in the industry side, in the government side, I worked with some very, uh, very strong SMEs and a lot of them knew more statistics than I did in, in terms of uh, theory and they could derive uh, moment generating functions and all that stuff. However, when it came to practical application of those methods, which is what DOE is about, or, or experimentation controlling noise, that was alien to them, other than one factor at a time or intuition-based designs. So 
I point this out to say, you know, this is back in 1967 when we didn't have the, the wonderful desktop tools that could build optimal design. So, you know, there, you can understand that a little bit more back then, but, you know, in modern times with the power that we have on our desktops to build optimal designs, and I find that 95% of the time I'm building optimal designs because I, I have to be flexible. Um, you know, so that, that's kind of the, some of the resistance that I, that I run into. And I wish I had known this stuff when I was just starting out. This is something that I've said myself, and literally I've had researchers and engineers in the last couple of years tell me this almost in these exact words. We've been experimenting on this with this system, these factors for three months. We do your design for one day, and then we learn all these things that we didn't learn in three months. How does that happen? And I said, well, it's a, the methods work. The statistics work. It's math. You can trust it. So, you know, and some, some very seasoned researchers said, you know, kind of slapping themselves on the forehead. I didn't know this when I was starting out. So to those maybe that are just starting out, the students listening in, even those that are mid, late career, if you're not using these methods, uh, especially if you're early along, learn, look into them while you're starting out. Give them a chance. You give yourself a big leg up, uh, a big advantage to other people that are working with data and are experimenting that are not using these, um, uh, these highly, highly efficient methods. And here's, here's, a, here's an interesting quote. Um, Statistical techniques are useless unless combined with appropriate subject matter, knowledge, and experience. And you might think that was said by a subject matter expert, but however, that was said by George Box, a very prominent uh, statistician. You know, so if he's admitting that, you know, so the statistics is useless unless we have subject matter expertise as statisticians, and, and I think I was guilty of this when I first came, I knew that, but I really wasn't sensitive to that. You know, I, I get so wound up and passionate and what the DOEs can do, I wasn't remembering that the SME involvement in the beginning, in the middle, and the end is essential. We can't do it with just statistics. Now, all that being said, um, this quote is interesting. It's easy to conduct an experiment in such a way that no useful inferences can be made. And you know, that means uh, maybe you did a bunch of one-shot experiments, uh, using intuition, you didn't hit a home run, you didn't even get a base hit. Now you got this, and I'm, the talk that we just heard about the 63 years of wasted data, that came to mind. I mean, I, I, I guess the data must be pretty easy to collect if you collected it for 63 years, but in the end, they ended up with this giant massive pile. And I'm thinking, that, that was a great story, by the way. I hadn't heard that. I, I knew that Fisher uh, you know, started in agriculture and in but, but the stories that I hear always pick up when he's running his DOEs. I, didn't, I never heard about this uh, tangled mess that he inherited when he first got there. Um, and again, George Box, statistics is a catalyst to discuss scientific discovery. And we've heard, we've heard other speakers uh, point this out and say it's statistics and science. You, you really need both. And I'm pulling from George Box a lot, but I'll, I'll do it again here. Uh, in his papers, he describes, you know, how do you tell somebody what DOE is? Well, it's like 20 questions, that game. It's a strategy for efficiently guessing. And, you know, in 20 questions, you, you, you uh, I'm, I'm thinking of an American movie star. You're going to say taller, shorter than six foot. I'll say taller, you know, male or female, uh, above, or below, above or below five foot ten, right? Each time we're cutting the possible answers in half. That's our strategy for guessing. Now, the game changes. Say, say I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a, a famous Australian cricket player pre-World War II. I can, still, I can still apply my strategy, you know, taller or shorter than six foot, born before or after 1920, and I can go on and on like that. My, my, my method is still sort of working. It's cutting the possible answers in half each time. However, the problem is I have no subject matter expertise, and probably very few people do. So I'll never get anywhere without the subject matter expertise. So that's an illustration of the um, uh, value of having the subject matter expertise. Uh, scientific method. I'm going to talk in iterative learning. I think a lot of times the scientific method kind of gets in the way a little bit from what we're trying to do. It's a great, you know, it's great. Uh, however, it tends to lend itself to a one hypothesis at a time method of iteration. And you know, you have an observation, you ask a question, you form a hypothesis, you run an experiment. You get back the data, you analyze it, and um, you know, you use some inductive reasoning and say, well, if the reality is this, then I need to tweak my model. So that, that's the iter iterative loop. And in the ideal world, it works like that. You have a model, 
you go out and collect some data, you, you know, deductively reason what it should look like, it's a reality check, you get it back, and we're progressing from left to right with sequential learning, we're building a better model each time. And that's the way it works in the ideal world. However, in reality, when, when we go one hypothesis at a time, I think it, it more or less works like this. So here's a scenario, I've got five factors, I'm putting a little fictitious uh, experiment together. Say I'm, I'm in the one hypothesis at a time, intuition, one shot at a time. So any, I'm going to run a test. I'm going to basically vary one thing by, by test group and my, and my, um, my control group. And in our scenario, five, five X, five replications would be pretty good, at, pretty good at, at controlling the noise. So when I do my first iteration, I take 10 samples. Now I say, okay, but what if I change the material? Do 10 more samples. Now, okay, now what if I keep that material but change the pressure? 10 more samples. And you can see how testing one hypothesis at a time with standalones, next thing you know, I'm up to 110 samples and I haven't explored every interaction. Maybe I've got the main effects by now. Compared to a DOE based philosophy where is all DOE is doing is with a screening design, I'm going to test lots of hypotheses, all the main effects at one time, one iteration. And maybe that burns 16 samples for this five factor. Then I come back and say, okay, now I'm going to make it a response surface. I'm going to test the uh, squared effects, interactions, 13 more samples maybe. But now I I'm taking huge steps, not little baby steps. So I've burned 29 samples compared to 110. It's still the scientific method. I'm not trampling on it. I'm just putting it on steroids, so to speak. Uh, another conceptual visualization, I, I use this a lot to teach people. You know, I shy away from the mathematics. That never got me anywhere. They, they know more usually more math than I do. So I say, I do, I do these uh, conceptual representations. So here's, here's a design space. And say we want to explore this design space. If we explore one factor at a time using replicates of exact replicates of five, we get these little windows. It's like Swiss cheese. If I look through these little windows into my design space, I have good resolution because I replicated, you know, I have a high replication level. And say I go up to 50 samples. So now I've got this these disjointed apertures where I have high resolution, but I don't know what else is going on in the design space, and I don't have a good feel of the characteristic of the entire design space, and, and I've used 50 samples. Uh, if I take the same, if I do the same thing, but with a DOE, you know, that's going to say, don't do 5x replication, do 1x replication, and we're going to spread the samples out. Now, this shows a, a, a symmetric grid, which is not really what it would be, but let's just say, the idea is the DOE does 1x replication, but spreads out all 50. And if you're, But the advantage we have with DOE is we can interpolate between these points. There's, the resolution at each point is not much because it's only 1x. However, when I, when I interpolate between those points, then all of a sudden I have a full picture. It's very, bl it's very blurry, it's out of focus, yet usually this picture is enough that I can see, hey, now I can understand this design space. I've got, if I'm looking for peaks, optimization, I've got some sub peaks. It looks like I have a, a global peak up here. So it's the difference of, you know, having high resolution, but a very discrete points only where you can't connect any of those dots because it's not an orthogonal structure experiment, as opposed to having a full field of view. It's blurry, but if it's good enough for me to optimize, then you know, I'm going to do my replica. I can get clear resolution any place that I want once I've optimized the system. And I, I, I use this a lot. It, it seems to help people have a feel of the difference between the, 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 one, the one shot snapshot experiments versus a uh, DOE style. And here's another statisticians are good for these quotes. You know, for analytical mathematical type people, they're, re they're really good at applied practical quotes. When running an experiment, the safest assumption is that unless extraordinary precautions are taken, it will be run wrong. And that's not a knock in any way on the people executing the experiment. It's just the reality of it, because like with our formulation DOEs, instead of, you know, they're used to running one or two formulations a day, I'm giving them, I'm giving them like uh, 70, 80, 100 different formulations. And on top of that, mixing up the materials, the agents, and the process, they're very complex. Um, and the extraordinary precautions that I take, I include them in all my DOE meetings so that they understand that it's important to keep the runs in a certain order and they understand why. And, and they know what, you know, what we're gonna be asking them to do. Uh, I, I read this quote by Doug Montgomery in a session one time and he was a little more extreme. He said, you know, if I have the opportunity, I'm looking over their shoulder, watching them run, run every experiment. Well, in our lab, I can't always go in the lab you know, because of what they're working with, it, it can be hazardous. Um, 
yeah, so include the people running the experiments in, in your in your team meetings and such. That's the, the advice there. I've got some the end of this section almost. I've got some recommendations for people earlier in their career. Be optimistic, be diligent, and I'll say there is hope. And the reason I say that is I've done STEM talks where people can see that, you know, I rattle on, I'm passionate about this, I get excited about this stuff. And they say, you know, how, how did you find a job that you really like, that you're really into? And I said, you know, he said, is there hope for us? And I said, yes, there's hope for you. You know, even if it's not what you're studying now, get into it, do it well, keep your eyes open, take some courses. You, you will eventually find something that, you know, that really drives you. And uh, also to students, DOE is a great tool to have, look into it, don't do what I did and say that I wish I didn't, I started using this a long time ago. And don't let the math and the statistics, you do not need to be a theoretical statistician to get a lot of mileage out of these DOEs, you really don't. Uh, for people that are just maybe just getting into it, just learning, uh, look at the DOE from the applied perspective. Again, don't try to understand every detail the way the mathematics, if you, if you can, you do, that's fine. But, and I say, pick a good starter case and jump in. And when I say jump in, I don't mean to contradict uh, um, one of the other speakers, I think it was Paul said, you know, don't jump into a DOE too early. And I agree with that, concur 100%. What I'm saying here is when I came into the center, we were working with these same factors for years. We knew all our noise levels, everything was known about this. I had everything I needed to, to design the first DOE. As a matter of fact, I had designed them, but there was still reluctance to try the first one, try the first one. And on some on my part, I'm like, is it gonna go perfect? You know, cause there's a lot of stake here, but just go ahead and do it, it, it will work. And uh, try to get yourself in a good uh, applied a DOE classes or workshop, and I've mentioned, uh, you know, as I said previously, the, the studies workshops work great for me. And to, to people that are regular practitioners, uh, keep in mind to uh, be aware and sensitive to what we do is, we think it's great, I think it's great, but really it's useless without the subject matter expertise and insight. And I gave up on really trying to push the math because most of it they already knew. And they knew more linear algebra than I did. I had to sell the wow factor where you're going to test all these factors at one time. Instead of going for three months, we're going to test for a day. If you don't like the results, you didn't waste anything. You can go back in the lab for three months. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a controversy comes up between physics-based models and empirical, and it doesn't need to be. They complement each other. I mean, physics-based models are great, but they, they tend to take a long time to, to really fit the parameters well you know, until you've got a good working physics-based model. And, and, you're, and like Box said, all models are wrong, even physics-based models. The DOE empirical models, they don't turn off the chemistry and all the physical mechanisms that everything is in play. It's just empirically, we study the net effects. The two can work hand in hand. And uh, the, the last couple bits, um, looking at the, the gap between the adjusted R-square and the predicted R-square, that'll come later in my presentation. And I'll say, don't be afraid to be aggressive with these the DOE designs. Uh, particularly the KCV designs. I mean, if anything, subconsciously, we tried to break that design and, and we couldn't do it. And I'll talk more on that later. All right, part two. Now I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get into, so he, here's the impact of what DOE has done for CBC. Uh, just on major programs since 2016, we've executed about 19 of them. That's really about 23 or 24 because I have a group in the last couple months that, that, that they're running at a pace about one every two weeks. And it's working great for them, they love it. Um, if I counted up all the days, it's about 57 days to execute those. And then if I said, well, if we were doing it the way we used to do it, you know, that, that could be replicated full factorial if it's feasible. It could be intuition-based. It could just be a lot of runs trying everything. I estimated the savings. So instead of 50, we used 57 days with DOE, we would have been about 1,700 days without it. That's a huge saving in laboratory days. And we don't turn the lights off and go home that those lab days were used to run other projects. So we extracted as much information in 57 as we would have gotten within 1700 if we weren't using these structured techniques. And on top of that, the DOE being so efficient, researchers are allowed to bring in more factors and the stakeholders that fund us, they'd love to see extra factors because it makes the research more applicable. And final formulation has gone down. We've reduced it to about one or two days, maybe three days versus it used to take months to get a reliable uh, final formulation. Now, the part particular case study I'm going to talk about today is a zirconium hydroxide. It's a slurry that we use as a de decontaminant, and this was our project in our branch. And it started off uh, in 2016 
where we had these filters where zirconium hydroxide is the active ingredient and they would go in tanks or buildings or ships and it would fill, it would neutralize the any chemical agent vapor that was in the air. Well, you know, being the inquisitive research and development types that we are, someone said, well, what if we take the powder that goes into those filters and mix it, mix it in, mix it up with something. Hey, kerosene's always in the field. Mix it up with some kerosene, throw some water in, make a make a slurry that you could, if your vehicle gets hit, your tank or whatever, piece of equipment, if it gets slimed, contaminated, then you put this slurry on it, maybe it'll neutralize. So that was the, they, some basic research was done. Uh, they found that we had reactivity. Um, this is just a schematic here of what our, when I say a panel test, this is what it looks like. These are two inch test panels we work with. Uh, we condition them, we contaminate them with a chemical agent. That's the two red drops that you see. We age it for a certain amount of time in which there's evaporation, but the, but the agent is also absorbing into the material, depending on which agent, which material, more or less so. Uh, skip that pre, pre rinse step for this experiment. Then, we, then we're going to decontaminate. That's that yellow gel that you see. It goes on top, it sits on there a certain amount of time. We rinse it off, we dry our panel. Then the panel goes in an extraction jar, and we're going to extract and do a GC mass spec on that solvent to back calculate how much agent survived was left in there after the decontamination. And we work in orders of magnitude because this response can vary by six orders of magnitude. We can go from 90% efficacy at, at, a, at a log reduction of one, a log reduction of six gets us to 99.9999 uh, efficacy. So. You might see later on we're talking log reduction units because we have a, and obviously we're doing a log transform because that's a very, you can't fit a, to stabilize the variance, we do log regression. So this is in 2016, we start off, and this isn't the experiment that I'm going to go, this is a design expert generated. This was actually the first formulation design we did in 2016, but we learned a lot from it. But this is really just the proof of concept. So the funding agency says, yeah, you got something there. Your basic research looks good, but is it ever going to be able to, you know, we, we can't put 38 blends on the shelf. Could you guys come up with one blend that works against these chemical agents? And there's actually a fourth one that I can't show here. Under these process conditions, and what kind of results are you going to get? So um, the, the actual, these numbers are not really meaningful other than uh, green is weak performance and red is the highest performance. So we, we, we did a, uh, this was a mixture process design, our first one, and we got the results. We fit these ternary plots, and right away you can see that the mixture behaves differently for different chemical warfare agents. And then we did the multi-objective optimization and said, what's the single blend, this global optimal, if you put one on the shelf that we do the best overall, best we can do. And point was, this was good enough to show the funding people that yeah, fund us to, to, to develop this further. It's got potential. Now, and this was done in six days of testing. If we had to ask for three or four months of testing just to prove the concept out, it, may, it might not have happened, honestly. And so this is about at, at the 2016-17 stage. We've got this stuff. It, it sprays on like a paint. Here it's going on a, on, a, on a test panel that doesn't have agent on it. And we can color it any way we want. But the, the DOE here, in the beginning, got really got this project rolling because it showed that that we, we we will we will eventually have something. It can work. One one formulation can do a lot. So jumping ahead here to 2020-21, uh, we used our second DOE, which is the one I'm going to talk about next, the big one, and uh, we got to final formulation. And this is showing a warfighter spraying this on a on a vehicle. It, it might have a simulant on. But there's no live agent on this one. We only use live agent in the laboratory. Um, so we use the DOE for the final formulation. Now, this is the really interesting part. So in 2020, we had proof of concept. Uh, uh, Joe Myers and the lab people, they did a lot of work. They came up with a couple other active ingredients. They substituted a couple solvents. And then, uh, you know, you kind of, the, the, the funding agency said, hey, you guys did such a good job on four agents. Now we wanted to work on six, uh, still four materials. So. The problem at hand, what we have to do with this design is to, to, to optimize it. We've got categorical factors. It's going to be a mixture process. Those are the purple ones. We've got six contaminants, and, and one of them is actually a bioweapon contaminant. The other five are chemical weapons, and they're all very different. We've got four materials, very different materials, some absorptive, some not. 
So that's six times four, that's 25, 24 agent material combinations. And what I, what I had been telling people was, you gotta realize that those 24, it's apples to oranges, but that's not really the case. It's like apples to T-bone steak in some cases. The agents behave very differently with different materials. And the solvents and the decontamination, they penetrate differently on different materials. So just 24 categorical factors would, would previously would have been months of work for us just to evaluate that. So then in, also in the design, they said, you know, so you guys can do so many variables, do four process factors. We're gonna vary the amount of uh, contamination. We're gonna vary the time that the contamination sits on the material. And then when we decontaminate, we're gonna vary how much decon volume and then how long we leave the decon on. That's four continuous process factors. And then finally, we get to our mixture, which we have um, five components, four of them remain nameless and they're in specific percentages, which you know, I'm not disclosing here. And if all that's not enough, we have uh, some additional constraints on the solvents because this stuff has to be sprayable when it's done. And they're shown down there at the bottom. So this is a really complex design space and it's really tricky because this is the first time, we, we've done several mixture process experiments by now, but this is the first time that we let the contaminant treat it just as if it was a factor. Previously, you know, since I said it's apples to steak, previously we would do a DOE around one agent at a time and vary a bunch of other things. But here we said, let's get aggressive. Let's do all the agents together, you know, as long as the lab can manage it, keep it all straight, which they said they could because they've had some experience now. So if we were to run this thing the way we used to do it in full factorial replicated, you know, so it, it would be six times four times, uh, for the continuous, say I went high, medium, and low times three times three times three times three. And then you can't really full factorial the formulation, but we could have picked five and then we replicate everything five times. So the old fashioned, more brute force way would be 48,000 samples, which would be years of funding, which we never would get, which really wouldn't make any sense. So at that point, we've got some options. Well, what we had done in the past, I mean, years ago, was we might reduce that design space. We might drop some agents, some materials, cut down the formulation components. But now, if we do that, we've reduced the relevancy of the study. You know, and this, the stakeholders, they have expectations. They don't want a, a formulation that works on one agent and one material. They want to see, you know, how is it going to do with a lot of our materials, a lot of different agents. And obviously, the solution that we said was, well, this has to be a mixture process formulation design. And so we, we built a design. This was a very ambitious design. Uh, we, we went special cubic on the mixture side, quadratic on the process. We limited the cross terms to three way. So it's like a KCV design. Uh, they would say only go two way, but we went three way because we have those two categoricals with lots of levels. And uh, when you've got categoricals in play, especially more than one, it's more, like, more than likely you will see some, some significant three ways effect because um, categoricals just lend themselves to uh, active uh, two, three, four way, it, sometimes four, I've definitely seen a lot of three way interactions. And the starting model was 489 terms, a huge model, 584 samples was gonna take us 10 days to run. We got 35 checkpoints in there. And the output would be, we get a, we're gonna get a great model that's gonna optimize this formulation. And, and by far, this is the most ambitious uh, mixture process that we've attempted, and you know, maybe that's been attempted on APG, quite probably is. Then we got a curveball. So this is in March of uh, 2020, maybe June or uh, January 2020, we put this design together, but before it ran, COVID restrictions come down. And now we're not going to get 10 laboratory days. You can only get so many days per month and operators have to stay in you know, social distancing and all that. So our manager came to uh, Joe Myers and, and I and said, you know, you guys can't have 10 days. Uh, can, can you do it in a couple? And I said, well, okay, you mean three, three days. And he said, well, yeah, what would you do? What would you do if you had only had three days? So with great reluctance, we, we thought about that and we said, well, We'd have, we'll have to sacrifice those three ways. It could be a mistake. We'll go down to a true KCV design. We'll only cross this thing two ways. That gets it down to 184 runs, which we can do in uh, three days. Still had 20 checkpoints in play. So we've gone from an ambitious design to what I call a really you know, somewhat risky, aggressive, ultra high efficiency design. If you remember that design space, we're saying that we're going to uh, characterize that in, in 
three laboratory days. You know, that's you know something like that would have taken months or year or years previously. Uh, just briefly, you know, this is this is what the model looks like. I'm going to, interest of time, I'll probably skip over this somewhat, but it's it's a mixture mixture process model. You've got the green terms for process, the orange for the mixtures. There's linear blending, nonlinear blending. We're up to we're up to uh, special cubic, and then we got the cross terms. And I crossed out these three three way cross terms. We're only going to do two way cross terms. And you know, the, this is a big bulky model, but it's really simple. With the DOE, is all we're doing is fitting those leading coefficients. That you know, it's not that hard. And here's here's the, the design expert view. When we built this model, it's an i-optimal design. We blocked it into three days. And here's the for lack of fit points. This is what I use for my checkpoints. And if I understand correctly, the design of expert it builds the model, and then you'll see it flip over, and it'll say fitting checkpoints. And what it does there is it tries to after it builds the design, it says, where is this design weak? Where is it least informed? Let me put a lack of fit point in there. And you know, a lot of times those get go into the model fitting. I like to hold them back. And the reason I hold them back is once I reduce my model, I then I'll evaluate those, you know, before I've gone back into the lab just to make just as a reality check to make sure that my model can predict at points that weren't used to fit it. And inside the software over here on the right, if you right click under row status and select verification for the lack of fit points after you've turned on build type. Uh, the software will, will withhold those from fitting the model. It, it'll, it'll calculate the, the predicted and your residuals, but it'll hold them back from fitting the model. And this lets me stack the deck. So when, uh, when, I, when I fit a design, I, I reduce, you know, and these things obviously always have to be reduced way down. We, can, we can't fit a even a 140 term model without having problems. Um, by the time we go into the lab for our confirmation runs, based on these checkpoints, I have confidence that we're going to get a desirable result. Here's just an example of, um, say we didn't reduce this model, if we fit the full starting model, look at what happens to the checkpoints. The checkpoints are the purple points. Those black ones, hey, those are all the design points. We fit them great. 99% R square. Um, R square adjusted is pretty good at 88. However, you notice R squared predicted, it's not even coming up negative, it's coming up non-applicable. And th that, that's, a, that's a warning flag, because as a design expert, has a, they show you a rule of thumb that your predicted R squared needs to be not more than 0.2 below the adjusted if you, need, if you want to be confident that your model can predict at unknown points, which is basically the only reason we do it. So here's a case of plot the data versus the, the, numeric, the numeric metrics, and plotting the data clearly shows that this model can't predict a lick. Uh, on those purple checkpoints. And those are the unknown points. That's what we wanted to predict that. So uh, next slide is, this is after we reduced the model, we ended up with a 48 term model. And I, I use backward reduction sometimes, sometimes I use them all, backward, forward, AIC, BIC. Sometimes one of them will stand out better than the other. Sometimes they all give you about the same thing. But you notice now with this model properly reduced, Okay, R square is not as good, but I don't care about the R squared. I, I've seen predictive models with a 50% R squared that are great predictors. I can optimize the system; doesn't matter. Um, however, my adjusted R square now my predicted is only about 0.13 below. That's a thumbs up according to the uh, design experts' rule of thumb. And incidentally, I haven't see, I don't see this rule of thumb between adjusted square, R squared and predicted R squared. Uh, I don't I haven't seen that anywhere else, quite honestly, and it's very effective. And if you look at my picture, now look what I've got. My purple checkpoints, they're right in the middle of the pack with the design. The design points don't fit quite as well, but the purple checkpoints are right there in the pack. That tells me I have an overfit and I've reduced it enough. And, I, and the fact that my purple points are lining up, I've got a good predicting model that, that will predict at unknown points. I haven't gone back in the lab and run anything else yet, but I'm already feeling pretty good about it. So this just compares, um, he compares the two scenarios, the original design before COVID, you know, which I, I said was by far the most aggressive that we had run at CBC. Um, it was 10 laboratory days and 489 model terms. The contingency design, we, we cut from the cross terms from three-way to two-way. We got it down to three days. And this, this did bite us a little bit. We, we can detect that there are some missing three-way terms. However, the beauty of the DOE is that it's modular. And going in, in the back of my mind, I said, if we can't fit a model from that three-day data, 
you know, understand that we're going to have to augment it and go back in and do those other, it fit those three-way turns, which is going to take about seven more days. And everybody understood that, but at least we had a, a fallback position. Here, the model fit pretty well without the three ways. Now, I said, you want to go get the three ways, you invest seven more days, you make this model a little better. However, as it turned out, everybody was happy with the model. So here's the actual versus predicted for the checkpoints. And keep this in perspective. These are points that were not used to fit this model. The response spans six orders of magnitude, and clearly that's pretty good predictive capability. Without question, it was enough to optimize this system to where we needed it to get. And if you remember that crazy convoluted design space, you know, to, to me, it's still, I was very pleasantly surprised, let's say, that in three days with these KCV designs, we were able to predict this well over six orders of magnitude, knowing, if nothing else, that I had 24 different agent material combinations in there that have different mass transport characteristics. The solvents have, have different uh, mass transport characteristics in the materials. Not to mention I had the continuous process factors. Not to mention I have a five component formulation that I'm playing with. So really quite remarkable. It blew away our expectations and I would encourage anyone uh, give some of these KCV designs a try. Typically, if we have a smaller design, we will like to keep those three-way cross terms because with categoricals, they do come into play quite often. However, you know, under under tough circumstances, we were able to get away and, and get what we needed uh, with only the two-way cross term. So kudos to the, the, the KCV design. And that's uh, it's built right into Design Expert. It's one of the drop-downs. Um, or I also like about Design Expert is I, I get a model drop down. I can go in and take terms in and out. And Design Expert is set up to, uh, for example, with mixture process, if you're crossing it, your linear process terms can't be in the model because they're redundant. Well, the software knows that for you. I don't have to go in and manually deselect them all. So another nice feature. Um, a lot of this talk comes from um, the, the work of George Box, and I kind of stumbled onto this. I, I think Mark Anderson mentioned it. Uh, this Wisconsin Center for Quality and Product Improvement. I assume this website's still up, but this is like a gold mine of uh, papers and reports, most of them by box, not all of them, that were done, I don't know, they go back to the 80s up into the early 2000s, and there's probably a couple hundred of them at least. And many, there, many of them are very applied, they're very great case studies, and a lot of the, the statistics as a catalyst for learning and statistics for discovery you know, I'm citing a lot of uh, what he talked about. You know, later in his career, I think his focus shifted a lot towards, you know, what's holding us back is not the technology and it's not the software now. It, it's it's human nature, it's habits, it's things that we've been taught since sixth grade. Uh, you have a control group, you have a test group. If you change more than one factor at a time, you don't you don't know what caused the difference. And I was taught that in middle school. And that that's it's true in the sense that if you just haphazardly change one factor more than one factor. But if you have an underlying structure, uh, Mark Anderson also mentioned something about the, the, the hidden replication. That's there. People, I, I try to teach people the replication's there. You just can't say it, even though we didn't do exact replicas. So at this website, so, you know, great information. And these are my references and resources, some of the, the things that, I, that I'm pulling from during this talk. Um, and maybe a, a parting shot. So here, uh, good takeaway. Uh, remember that it's not statistics alone. Uh, remember the the, the the 20 question analogy about the, the Australian cricket player. Uh, that strategy was very efficient. I was cutting my possibilities by 50% every question I asked. Is it ever going to be effective? No, because I don't know any uh, pre-World War II Australian cricket players. So the key is the statistical design for the efficiency, uh, the control of the error, combining that with what the subject matter experts can pour in, their knowledge of physical mechanisms. They have to basically identify the factors. They have to, you know, be, be in charge of setting the factor levels. There will be some back and forth. We'll kind of, you know, uh, give them some advice, but they basically know what the factor levels should be. And, and then disallowed combinations. So it, it takes both. When you have the efficiency of the statistics, the subject matter expertise, efficiency plus the expertise equals effective. You can be very efficient and not learn anything. Um, and Box also had said that, yeah, subject matter expertise alone, you can conduct an investigation, maybe not very well, not very efficiency, efficiently, but um, 
without the subject matter expertise using statistics, you can't. The opposite is not true. And I think that brings me pretty close to the end here. Um, well, a couple takeaways for the students out there. I use this on my, my, my STEM. Uh, know that you can turn all the knobs at the same time and test many factors at once. And these are kind of these are kind of teasers, you know, because they're going to say, I, I, well, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't learn that. That doesn't sound right. This is how I start my talks off. And then uh, second point is, you don't have to do any exact replicates. You know, a lot of times, very seasoned researchers will balk at this one and say, you can't do any statistics if you don't have exact replicates. And again, it gets into that hidden replication. I, I use this to kind of, you know, start a, start a dialogue, start a conversation, and then. To the more intermediate and advanced users, always remember and be cognizant that as excited as we get about DOE, without the subject matter intuition, without the science, we, we really, it really can't do much. But together, the statistics can be the catalyst uh, for scientific discovery. And I've seen many examples, which I won't necessarily go into. Um, last one, since I've got a minute here. Takeaway message, another analogy, you know, some of these might seem a little hokey, but I found they could be more effective in trying to explain mathematically what DOE does. So if I'm looking for the needle in the haystack, I'm looking for my optimal, say it's a needle in a haystack. If I look one factor at a time, that, that's like taking a very powerful magnifying glass and, and very narrow field of view and sorting my way through the haystack. It's high resolution, but it's narrow field of view, as opposed to DOE. DOE is like sweeping the whole haystack at one time with a, a metal detector. Now, you don't have a lot of resolution, but you may hone in on a certain area, then you come in with your, your second stage design, your handheld metal detector, and then you then chances are you're gonna find that needle a lot faster rather, rather than, you know, unless you happen to stumble on it going through it with a magnifying glass. I think I'll stop there. I think I've hit, I've hit my, my mark, hopefully. And uh, thanks every, everyone for listening. Uh, again, thanks for the, the opportunity. I've got my email here. As you can tell, I love to talk about these things. Anybody has any further questions, specific questions, just to compare notes and potential, potential collaborations if there's any government people out there still tuned in or not, or not government people. We do, we do all kinds of collaborations. And, we, and I do, you know, short consultations, short questions and answers, just compare notes kind of thing. So that's my email. Love to talk to everyone and uh, thanks thanks to the hosts, uh, other speakers. I enjoyed it, took lots of notes, learned a lot, and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Jay. We appreciate your time. There is one question that I think everybody's curious about. Um, did you end up finding an optimal universal treatment for um, that collection of, of factors? Oh, yeah. I, I guess... I guess I got uh, I got so wound up I neglected to. Uh, yeah, yes, we did. We, we found a single global optimal, and uh, that particular work, if you'll notice, it, it was very vague in terms of what percentages and what the ranges were because that 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 decontamination slurry is getting just about ready to leave the, leave our hands and go on to program managers, which will actually it, it's well on its way to being fielded. Um, so I, I can't say what that particular formulation was, but yeah, that's probably my, that's probably a um, uh, dropped the ball a little bit on that. Uh, yes, we, we did get to, I, I was so wound up showing how good the model was. And yes, that model was a great tool. We, uh, we, we predicted, you know, a few different varieties of, of global optimals, maybe two, and uh, went back in the lab and ran like 10 or 15 exact replicates of each one, tried it on a handful of different materials under different processing conditions. And lo and behold, yes, it, it came back the results were what the model predicted, and then uh, the collaborating partner and anybody else that wanted to throw their two cents in, uh, they, they tried some other formulations, some just you know, just to see, and we could not we could not find a formulation that across the board that was better than the one that was predicted by the the DOE model. And I'll also say that at this point. Um, working with our industry partners that we kind of expected the outcome of this big experiment to be one thing in terms of the ratios of some of the components. And, um, you know, in other words, they had a, uh, they had a nominal formulation that, that seemed to be pretty good. And the DOE told us something different and said, well, you can do somewhat better. Uh, 
uh, by using this formulation. And then when we tested it, compared them side by side, yeah. So, so the, the DOE didn't tell us something that we already knew. It, it told us, um, it, it pointed us in a direction to a better optimal. So to answer the question, uh, yes, I, I couldn't really, you know, design expert has some great screens where I, I could show the, the response surfaces and the plots, but I, I can't specifically say what what that optimal, you know, how well it performed or what the formulation looked like. But yeah, my okay, fault. Sorry okay. about that. We did, we did get a little optimal. It was a huge class. Yeah. Um, one more question here. How did you handle concentration ranges in the context of compounds that have very different activities, i.e. multiple log differences? Uh, when we when we put these usually when we put our designs together, we we do them sometimes by volume ratios by volume. It's usually ratios by weight, and so I'll build a design with ratios by weight, and then it's mostly the the SME is working with the SMEs. They decide you know when we when we have um, those those solvents or some of those actives are actives that are in a, in some other carrier. They decide that. Um, what the what the concentration of the reagents that we're pulling from, what it's going to be, what the stock concentration is going to be, and then my design is just like a you know it's a baking recipe. It says add so many uh, so many milligrams, nanograms, or whatever, or, or I guess grams we work in. Add so many grams of this, so many grams of that. So when when we're done, we have a formulation that's in terms of mass units, and it's based on whatever the concentrations were on the starting materials. So if somebody tries to, you know, if we want to um, reverse engineer that, we have to be careful that we look back and we know, you know, it was so many grams of a certain concentration of this active so that we can reproduce it later. But we don't, we don't design, um, we don't design the experiment uh, using concentrations. We either use, I guess, I guess just to keep it simple for the people that are actually weighing, you know, weighing these out or measuring them by volumes, usually by weight. It seems to work pretty well. We get pretty reliable, reducible, reproducible results by specifying the DOEs in terms of weights. And then the SME will initially set, you know, whatever starting concentrations of those uh, liquid reagents, whatever it needs to be. Hopefully that answers the question. Right. Somebody else wants to know if you um, do use any traditional um, uh, designs like central composites, or do you pretty exclusively use optimal designs? Yeah, I, I, I think the very first one we ran, which was non-formulation in, in 2016, not to, I'm sorry, in, in 2010, the first one that I could twist enough arms to, and it took a three hour infomercial by me saying how great these designs were before they finally said, yeah, okay, we'll try. And, and my manager, you know, he was on board, but he said, if we can't get, if we can't get a design here, this system lends it so much self to a DOE, we got to do it here, get them in a room for three hours, you know, until they submit basically. And, you know, they, they were on board with it by the time we tried it. Um, so that design was a non-mixture and it was a quarter fraction design. Very, you know, I started off very safe, very simple, and the factors didn't have a lot of uh, disallowed com any disallowed combinations or restrictions, so it worked. Now, since then, I'm going to say every single design that we've actually run has been optimal. D optimal if we're not in formulation, I optimal if we're doing formulations. And the reason being is in industry and with the government, Almost every case, 97% of the time, when we go to do a meaningful DOE, which means we have more than two or three factors, something comes up where this factor can't be high when this one's high. This categorical has five levels. This categorical has two levels. And this one can never play with that one. And then, you know, once you start throwing those restrictions in there, you're out of the textbooks. It has to be optimal. So there might have been a couple looking back that I, that I could have run a traditional a central composite, a, a fractional design, but I, at this point, I don't even bother. I, I just go right to combined optimal, and you know, if if the situation is straightforward, the optimal design will look just like a, you know, pretty much just like a, a, a fractional design anyway. But uh, no, to answer the question in, in the in, in the real world of experimentation, I find that it, it's it would be almost almost never 
am I going to get a scenario where the factors don't have restrictions? They have the same number of levels where I could even think about doing a, um, you know, a more classical fractional central compositor or something like that. And certainly in formulation, we never have the case where everything can go zero to 100 percent. Maybe one All time. Right. In that case. Well, I just want to thank you, 